Well, uh, good evening, good morning to some people and good evening to those who are in Turkey and uh, good afternoon to a lot of other people just because uh, those who are watching our channel. We would like to thank and to welcome our uh, the, the keynotes, Marianne Johnson from United States. Uh, the, today, this is like, uh, she's the fifth keynote for today. Uh, and we would like to welcome her once again uh, here with uh, Professor Maria, Marianne Johnson. You are here, welcome. You are now online and uh, I will give you the speech without taking your time. You are online, now you can start. Okay, thank you very much. I'm going to uh, share my screen here, I think. Of course, you have the permission, sir. Uh, All right. Um, thank you very much for having me here today. Uh, it's really a pleasure. I always enjoy uh, a chance to talk to people, uh, especially these days when we don't see so many new people. Um, Would you maximize the slide because sometimes it won't? Uh, can you put that in the chat? I didn't hear you. I said, like, could you like open the slide at a maximum slideshow because it's too small? Yes. Uh, again. In the upper beside preview, we have this. Yes, over there also. I don't usually use this computer. We have a slideshow in the upper slideshow. We can click there. No. You can do it a uh, slideshow, Professor. Beside the view. You, you can't see me, but you can see the slides. We are seeing the slide, but it's too small because we we'll let us slideshow beside it. I will take it left. Click on the slideshow. Okay. Oh, here we go. That better? No, we are not seeing anything now. It's could you share the screen again? Could you share the screen again? Yes. All right, sorry. Looks like there's always something. At the bottom, we have in green. Like uh, again, icon, share screen, can click the share screen, yes. So now the slideshow, play from start. Yes. How's that? Now it's okay, you can continue. <laughs> Thank, you. Okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, I said every meeting I go to starts like this and I'm just as bad as everyone else. Um, all right, so. I'm Marianne Johnson. I'm at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. Uh, some of you who are interested in the history of economics may have received emails from me. I'm also the secretary of the history of the Economic Society. And at the end, uh, if you don't get your, our emails, um, I hope that you will send me an email and we will get you on our mailing list. Um, because we try to collect a lot of these sorts of events and uh, bring them together uh, and share information uh, about the history of economics in Europe and the United States and South America, frankly. Um, so this paper that I'm going to present today is part of a larger contribution uh, to improve efforts on the representation of women in the history of economics, as well as the quality of work on women in the history of economics. So um, there's quite a few different uh, activities going on at the moment in uh, economic uh, history of economics groups. Uh, one in particular that I'd like to point you to is the Women's Caucus. And this is a collaboration between members of the History of Economic Society, members of the European Society for the History of Economic Thought, and we have a website. Um, I hope you'll visit it. 
Uh, in addition, there's a number of other uh, publications that will be coming out, as well as conferences um, and organized uh, seminars, including the History of Political Economy Conference at Duke in 2021. That's what this paper is for. Economia uh, has just issued a call for a special issue on women, economics, and history, diversity within Europe. Um, and so they are looking for papers on women who have not traditionally been represented in history of economic thought. And this could be women who work in, uh, who are activists, uh, issues with women receiving the vote, um, women who are doing sort of practical on the ground economics in their communities or in their government. Um, and I think there will be a lot of room uh, for people who uh, participate with the International Symposium uh, to find topics for this. There's going to be another issue of research in history of economic thought and methodology. This one's devoted to Hazel Kirk, who is an economist at Chicago in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s. And you can see right, there's a number of other activities going on. For the HOPE conference, um, one of the things I should say is that um, when I was asked to write an Eleanor Ostrom, I thought this was going to be an easy task because I generally write on the history of public choice. Um, but it turns out that Ostrom is an incredibly unusual and complex in a lot of different ways. So trying to understand Ostrom as a woman in economics uh, quickly becomes difficult. She was a very unusual selection to have won the 2009 Nobel Prize in Economics. And she trained as a political scientist. She worked in a political science department. She considered herself a broad-based social scientist. She believed in asking big, open-ended questions. She preferred mixed methods to specialization. And she rarely published in economics journals. In fact, uh, she, only, she had published essentially no articles in what we would consider a top five journal when she won the Nobel Prize. And she worked at Indiana University, uh, a regional public university in the Midwest of the United States, rather than a prestigious institution. She was also the only woman to have won the prize in its first 41 years. The objective of the HOPE Conference volume uh, is to produce new knowledge on the trajectory, intellectual content, and practice of economics as a discipline by integrating historiographical developments from related fields of inquiry and applying them to the study of economics, of women in economics. One of the problems with traditional histories of women is that they've been portrayed as lone voyagers. Right? These sorts of studies generally examine the experience of a single great woman presented as an exception or a special case. Uh, if you look at a lot of studies of Joan Robinson, this is very much what you see, right? A very unusual uh, economist. As an alternative, what I'd like to do in this paper is consider women as members of a scholarly community and try to figure out where they fit in and how they interact with their community. Um, one tool that Eleanor Ostrom yielded particularly effectively was what we call the small N case study. This was her first level choice to gain insights into situations characterized by complex social relationships. Although uncommon for a political scientist or an economist, these case studies are typically employed by sociologists and anthropologists. Ostrom argued that case studies are an excellent first step in examining the validity of a theory. If a theory asserts that X is impossible, finding a single case where X negates the current theory, right, um, is evidence, right, that the theory is not as good as it claims. Uh, Ostrom's examination of common pool of resource problems, right, which is what she is most known for, began as a case study of groundwater basins in Los Angeles. Such an examination of real world situations led Ostrom to realize that communities could design effective institutional arrangements to share common pool resources. And this led her to challenge Garrett Hardin's inevitability of the tragedy of the commons. So the methodology here that I wanna to employ today is guided by Ashram's work with small in case studies. And she says that we need three levels of analysis. We need to understand the individual behavioral choices. We need to understand the micro or community situation. And we need to understand the larger social ecological context. 
So the case study method generally is what she defined as a research strategy of focusing intensively on individual cases to draw insights about casual relationships in a broader population of cases. All right, case studies can be exploratory, they can be open-ended investigations, or they could be evaluative testing of theories. So to apply Ostrom's case study method with her own career begins with the fundamental question, right? What strategies did Ostrom use to navigate and define a successful career as a woman in the social sciences? And can these strategies lead to broader conclusions or broader strategies for women in general? Oops. Ashram had lots of thoughts on the organization and institutions of academia. One of the claims that she made when she thinks about you know, how we function right, as professionals is that proponents of new theories and associated methods, she says, face an existential fight for recognition and survival. The degree of perceived existential threat depends on the extent to which fellowships, job opportunities, publishing outlets and research grants are open or closed to diverse theories and methods. A lot of biographies discuss why was Lynn, and as she was known, so successful, but they tend to focus on personal characteristics that are difficult or impossible to replicate. And this is Ashram's habit of getting up at four in the morning, her hobby of building furniture. Um, Instead, her case study suggests that we should look for strategic choices and rational decisions and to consider how individual functions in the context of the larger group. Proceeding as such, right, Ashram's existential fight for recognition and survival can be dissected into two interrelated challenges. The first relates to her efforts to be recognized as an individual scholar separate from her husband and the collaborative production of the workshop. All right, so if you're unfamiliar with Ostrom's uh, biography, uh, she trained as a political scientist in the 1960s. Uh, she eventually married one of her professors, Vincent Ostrom, uh, who was a well-known political scientist at the time. Uh, they moved to Indiana University from UCLA, where she studied. And there they founded something called the Workshop in Political Analysis and Political Theory and Analysis. Um, which is very much a sort of research grant generating um, collaborative research program uh, that involved enormous numbers of faculty and students uh, once it was fully established. And so separating her from either the production of the workshop or her husband becomes complicated. One of the issues was her propensity to conflate her own work with that of her husband. When I started this project, I wondered why they didn't give him the Nobel Prize as well. But I think it'll become clear, right, as we go through uh, a little bit of Ostrom's career here, uh, what was going on. There's a story that when uh, she received the call to from the Nobel Prize Committee, right, informing her that she won, that she shook her husband, right, this happens at four in the morning in America, wake up, honey, we have won a prize, right, and by the time she was done doing interviews at the end of the day, right, everyone had won a prize, all of her former students, her colleagues, her co-authors, so she was very much one to think about research as a collaborative exercise. However, archival and autobiographical evidence suggests the Ostroms took her career as seriously as his. Carving out an independent career for Eleanor drove both the choice to move to Indiana University and to forego children. And although Ostroms initially shared a research program rooted in Vincent's studies of polycentric government organization and theories of public administration, this uh, was a fairly temporary uh, piece of her career that we can see there in the late 60s and early 1970s. Um, following the completion of her doctoral dissertation in 1965, they co-authored a series of articles. Of Eleanor Ostrom's first eight publications, six were co-authored with Vincent. However, starting in the early 1970s, she began her work on the institutional organization of police departments. That's sort of the first chunk of um, work that forms her career. 
From the mid-1970s onward, her collaborations with Vincent became the exception rather than the rule, characterized by points of interest in their largely now distinct research programs. In fact, out of more than 350 lifetime journal articles, book chapters, conference proceedings, and governmental institutional reports, Ostra co-authored only 14 with her husband. She had seven other co-authors with whom she worked more than Vincent over the course of her life. If we look at the trajectory on the graph here, uh, one of the important things to note are the periods in which she's still authoring a lot of papers. And you can see that this is in the late 1970s, early 1980s, and again in the early 1990s. The 1980s were particularly important a decade for Ostrom for her personal growth and research. It was driven in large part by the year she spent in Germany with Reinhard Selten, who had shared the Nobel Prize uh, with John Nash in 1994. Public choice and game theory came to stake out larger space in Ostrom's toolkit, and her work shifted primarily from topics related to public administration to topics at the intersection of economics and political scientists. She states of her work at this time, the way game theorists think about strategic possibilities in social settings strongly influences the way I analyze central questions. In the 1990s, we can see that this is a work that's part, that largely influenced by her theoretical exploration in game theory. She shifts back to ecological questions in the theory of the commons. Um, and in 1990, she publishes Governing the Commons, which is the book that was most noted by, by the Nobel Prize Committee for her award. Despite her emphasis on the co-production of knowledge, we can see that Ostrom consistently turned out sole authored papers at rates roughly equal to collaborative works. Uh, this is important because it signals that she has a vibrant independent research program. And she averaged more than six publications a year over her life, roughly half of which were sole authored, about 35.8% actually. Right? And this sort of productivity was sustained by a cadre of well-trained research assistants organized through the workshop. They analyzed, organized, coded, and produced case studies for Ostrom. A second aspect of her work that's uh, particularly important, uh, if you want to see her as sort of an independent scholar and uh, sort of how she forges right, her own path, is uh, her interdisciplinary work. So I said previously that Ostrom's existential fight for survival and recognition was a battle on two fronts, securing recognition as an individual and securing recognition for work that did not fit neatly into any one academic field. Her work is a proponent of new theories and associated methods in particular. She worked at the intersection of economics, public policy, political science, ecology, and environmental and public administration. Her methodologies are no easier to categorize. By 1982, however, she began to characterize her work as straddling the academic disciplines of political science and economics. And her shading to economics becomes more and more pronounced after Germany. In fact, of the 33 papers that I classify as pure economic works out of her uh, entire, right, um, entire publications, they're all published after 1982. Papers suggesting the economics of common pool resources related to environmentalism, ecology, and public policy, for which she won the Nobel Prize, are all published after 1993. Ostrom conceived of herself as a broad-based social scientist. As such, we might speculate that her interdisciplinarity made, her, made publishing more challenging. And she certainly recognized the difficulty. Right? She complained that, unfortunately, promotion, tenure, and hiring committees are frequently composed of colleagues specializing in one discipline and who evaluate the work of others by the number of publications in their own discipline, totally discounting publications in interdisciplinary journals. Bruno Frey character, or picturesquely characterized this as intellectual prostitution. Right? The argument he makes is that editors effectively ask as disciplinary gatekeepers demanding conformity with field specific methodologies and approaches. And referees are a censuring system, making it most difficult to have unconventional ideas accepted. 
So instead of conforming to the constraints of top tier journals, Ostrom chose to publish in venues more amenable to her interests. She opted for multidisciplinary field journals such as public choice, land economics, ecological economics, world development, and ecology and society. She also frequently published in early volumes of new journals and accepted invitations for special issues. A third effective strategy to play by Ostrom was to publish a lot of book chapters. Right? You can see here her book chapters compared to journal articles. So out of the 350 so publicate lifetime publications, right? she had 151 book chapters to 169 journal articles. Roughly substitutes in terms of time and effort, book chapters generally come with fewer editorial and referee restrictions than journal articles, allowing authors greater room for novelty and creativity. All right, if we move on and we consider the micro situation of the workshop, all right, so we can see Ostrom's individual strategies, right, as, um, an as an economist, as a social scientist, right, her choices for publication, for publication partners. The second aspect, right, that Ostrom tells us we have to analyze is the community in which somebody works. And for Ostrom, her community was the workshop on political theory and policy analysis founded in 1973. She argued about the workshop that a diversity of perspectives is essential to the vitality of any research tradition, yet it also presents challenges for the scientific community. There have been a number of studies, you can see them listed here, that have examined the central role the workshops played as a critical intellectual space for both Eleanor and Vincent Ostrom. My focus is on how the structure of the workshop supported Ostrom's research goals. Initially conceived in the early 1970s as a colloquial series to bring students and faculty across various disciplines together for a serious discourse about the structure of diverse uh, political economies and the incentives they generated and the patterns of outcomes. The workshop was quickly formalized with private physical space coursework and seminars independent of the political science department. This was important for the ashrams because of their ongoing dissatisfaction with departmental leadership, particularly a move by the department to stifle interdisciplinary teaching and research by limiting the emphases at the undergraduate and graduate level. So the workshop gave the ashrams freedom right, to teach and research the way they wanted. While many studies of communities emphasize the importance of a dominant individual, John Maynard Keynes at Cambridge or George Stigler at Chicago. Others suggest that innovation is more likely around the edges of the discipline and in collaborative rather than hierarchical groups. The institutional organization of the workshop reflects this, right? And Ostrom's desire to quote, establish an environment to enhance co-production of knowledge, deliberately making an effort to leverage the very understanding we get from our research and build it into the way we operate in the workshop. Yet, although Ostrom was committed to interdisciplinarity for both philosophical and practical reasons, she also recognized the importance of shared language and terms to facilitate communication across disciplines. In the workshop, much of this came from the public choice and political economy traditions, building upon earlier works in classical political theory, as well as what would become new institutional economics and later on game theory. The works of James Buchanan and Gordon Tullock were among the pillars of the workshop curriculum, along with the work of Herbert Simon and aspects of rational choice theory. The common framework or the lingua franca of the workshop was microeconomics and political economy. They facilitated cooperation and teamwork by requiring everyone from students to visiting scholars to affiliated faculty to attend a year long course in political economy as a way of getting everyone to share the common language. This is also important for Ostra being recognized for her work as an economist. So returning to the question of how the workshop contributed infrastructure, resources, and support for Ostrom's career, um, we can see that the workshop was launched simultaneous to Ostrom's research program on polycentric metropolitan and particularly police services. The program conducted over that decade resulted in articles, books on metropolitan design and service delivery that eventually challenged understandings in public policy, urban policies, and other fields. 
The advantage of the workshop and its structure was, as Ashram described, collaboration makes it possible to spread the cost of data collection while retaining comparability. Um, so over time, the workshop evolves into a massive entrepreneurial science team. And Ashram described that partnerships create opportunities for enriching research. Collaboration enables the coll collection of a greater variety of observations and the use of a greater diversity of methods by bringing together scholars from different disciplinary backgrounds and skill set. The idea of scale is an important component. While the time and effort to build the workshop was immense, economies of scale were gained in the production process. Right? Another way Ashram corralled workshoppers to increase productivity by was teaching much of the core curriculum and supervising the vast majority of dissertations. Although Vincent Ashram initially held a heavier teaching schedule in the workshop by the mid 1970s, Eleanor's courses applying workshops, theoretical conceptions and rigorous fieldwork as well as quantitative analysis and modeling, including game theory, have become part of the core curriculum. Similarly, while the dissertations produced out of the workshop in the early 1970s were supervised roughly equally by Vincent and Eleanor, by the 1980s, Eleanor Ostrom was sitting at 90% of the defenses and served as dissertation chair for most, a diligent form of quality control. The investment paid off in well-trained research tra assistants deployed to pursue various aspects of her research program. Every participant could and was expected to contribute, regardless of his or her standing in the broader arena beyond the workshop. The extent of the all-in involvement of the workshoppers is evident from the Ostrom's archival MSS, which records boxes and boxes and boxes of student work organized under larger headings of Ostrom's own projects. Students were deployed to collect and analyze data, conduct surveys, build case studies, and generate bibliographies. To produce governing the commons, for example, Ashram trusted her research assistants with the case studies for the work produced within their area. The lengthy preface of the book outlines the various contributions by collaborators and scholars. With two of her students, Gardner and Walker, Ashram devised common pool lab experiments all right, so experimental economics uh, to support the case study analysis and governing the commons, which resulted in the book Rules, Games, and Common Pool Resources in 1994, which delved into new aspects of public goods problems. Although the book was co-authored by Gardner and Walker, their contributions from at least four others for su substantial content. So judged based on the quality of output, publications, databases, theories, and awards, the workshop was a highly successful academic enterprise. The workshop, however, also served another role, acting as an insulating barrier for Ostrom, an incubator in which she could test ideas without encountering overt or structural gender discrimination found in the discipline. Discouraged from graduate study in economics, Ostrom secured path-breaking matriculation in political science program in UCLA. From there, she encountered difficulty securing a permanent position and ran up against structural barriers in publishing, promotion, and tenure. So the workshop functioned to counter these experiences by working together to build an intellectual community on a foundation of teamwork, equality, and deep personal regard for each other. The massive grant funding Ostrom received also insulated Ostrom from administrative and disciplinary or department demands as well as forcing her to engage broadly with any single discipline and she could continue her multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary work. So the last piece of the puzzle is Ostrom in the broader sociological, social ecological context. Right? And she talks about how she winning the Nobel Prize um, was a relief to her, right? She said she didn't think she fit in anywhere. And she was relieved that after all these years of struggle and hard work, someone really thought it added up to something. Ostrom's reputation as an economist hinges on two interrelated lines of research. The first include her contributions to the theories of voluntary provision of public goods. <coughs> this type of work has been linked with that of Charles Tebow and James Buchanan, what one might call traditional public choice theory and with the institutional analysis of Douglas North. A second line includes her contributions to game theoretic formulations of individual and small group behavior and the experimental testing of such theories. 
This work aligns much more closely with central disciplinary methodological trends that tend to prioritize mathematical modeling of game theoretic situations verified by empirical testing. The latter has been associated with a highly theoretical work of Selton. Ashram decides her own academic career as being devoted to the development of empirically grounded theories to cross the great divide between economics and political scientists. In the conduct of comparative institutional analysis, she's particularly interested in how public economies evolve to provide and produce public goods. Ashram argued that the structure of the academic system discourages collaboration and encourages hyper-specialization. Yet historically, as a profession, the social sciences have rewarded individual innovation and individual accomplishments more than collaborative research. Publications rarely have more than three authors. Her book, Working Together, you saw an image of this at the beginning, was with two co-authors, discussed a range of problems from competition for professional status and resources to the often problematic influence of career incentives on methodological practice to the high entry costs for methodological border crossing. So if these are all the case, how did Ashton come to be recognized as an economist, not the least one worthy of consideration for a Nobel Prize? Ashton was not the first political scientist to win the prize. Herbert Simon won in 1978, Daniel Kahneman, a professor of psychology and public affairs, shared the award in 2002 with Vernon Smith. In all three cases, a key aspect of the work by these non-economists was their formal game theoretic presentation, experimental testing of the game concepts, and the development of complex adaptive agent-based models to stimulate the social dynamics that appear to conform to what we think of as science right, in our current culture. Thus, despite frankly little work in economics journals, Ostrom did adopt the scientific methodology of game theory in experimental economics and move things substantially forward for understanding group decision making. And this is what's recognized right, as economics. However, the Nobel Committee specifically also recognized Ostrom's fieldwork and case studies, even though these are often seen as less scientific and less valuable by economists. Uh, the joke Ashram tells is that economists win the Nobel Prize for elegant blackboard exercises in pure reason, and political scientists win the Nobel Prize for detailed studies of practical reason. Whether Ashram would have been considered without her impressive contributions to game theory remains an open question. If we compare Ashram's citations with those of Nobel laureates working in related areas, I was checking to see if I had the table in here, but I don't. Uh, we can see that she compares extremely favorably, despite being the most recent Nobelist. Um, so I compare her to Gary Becker, James Buchanan, Ronald Coase, Douglas North, and Vernon Smith, uh, the economists who I identified who won the Nobel Prize, whose work was most similar, I would say, to Eleanor Ostrom's, right? So it doesn't make sense to compare her to Eugene Farmer or Robert Schiller, but I think this collection um, kind of captures the picture of people who work with that slice right, of economics. Anyway, out of that group, Ostrom holds the highest H index and the second highest total number of citations, measured either as Web of Science or by Google. Ostrom's most cited publication by far is her governing the commons, which is what the Nobel Committee particularly recognized. Ostrom used case studies of specific situations to form generalizable hypotheses that could be in turn tested as theories. Applying the same method, right, I attempt to identify some of the strategies that Ostrom used successfully to build her career at the individual level, Right? And so those were her publishing strategies, right? her use of um, interdisciplinary journals, the collection of co versus saw at their papers, and her tendency to publish book chapters. Uh, in addition, the small group level, so how the workshop functioned right, to allow Ostrom such an enormous amount of research right, and research support. And then more generally at the macro level, Right, so at the level of the discipline of economics. All right, so the generalizable conclusions are still fairly new. Um, the paper is very much something that's a work in progress. 
uh, I would very much value uh, ideas, suggestions, questions, anything. Um, as I'm continuing to work on the project. And I just put here, um, for people who are particularly interested in Ostrom's sort of biography and uh, what life was like for a woman working in the social sciences in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, you can see that pretty much at every point or every step of the way, right, she encounters serious challenges um, as a woman in her field. Uh, and so the fact that she was the first woman to be recognized with the Nobel Prize in economics, right, is surprising, but her colleagues and students said at the same time it was not because she worked so successfully, even the doubters were forced to recognize the quality of her work. All right, thank you very much. If you want me to stop sharing my screen, I can. I know that it's hard to see people. <laughs> Hi, Professor. Yes. Look, looking for uh, questions. Wait a minute. 